The indirect, I should introduce my panel, Tim Watts and <laughs> Tim Wilson. I just, you know, forgot the viewers didn't realise they were here. <laughs> Their last appearance, at least in the studio of the year, so don't get too wistful, gentlemen. <laughs> Merry Christmas to all. Of yes, course. and to all a good night. With, <laughs> there you go. With the red tie, I think he wins on the Christmas front in that regard. But That's the socialist tie. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Do you call Santa a socialist? This, this pursuit, <laughs> no, I just you. This pursuit um, indirect shares, I mean, it kind of, what, what happens if you've got a superannuation? It, uh, account with a whole host of indirect interests. You have to list all of them. He does, if you click on his uh, interests, you can get out and see his interest in this particular company, F1 GFA, I think it's called. So it's there. Well, Tom, I have to say, I wasn't able to hear Mark Butler's press conference there. Um, I, Angus Taylor, all I can say is that I take his claims for the significant grain of salt at this point. He has to be Just the most accidental, pr accident prone minister in, in the Morrison government. Seems every other day he's, he's up with another scandal or debacle. So I, I'll be listening closely to Mark's uh, press conference right. after we get out of here. But Has he had a good year, Angus Taylor? Well, this is a complete farce. That's what we need to say. And you acknowledge it in your introductory question. <laughs> you asked the question about indirect interest. And this is the point. In your parliamentary declaration, you're supposed to uh, put your direct interest. And by the way, not all members of parliament do that. In the past, Matt Thistlethwaite hasn't even listed his superannuation fund. And now you're grilling into other people's interests. This has become a joke where Labor is constantly raising red herrings, arguing that this is the be all and end all and defining moment of a ministerial career rather than focusing on the substance, rather than focusing on the drought, rather than focusing on health delivery rather than focusing on economic management right. well, they I, distract on things I'm going to move that aren't into relevant. some of the other topics today Medivac I'm interested in, in what way is this mission critical for the nation right now this bill well it's absolutely critical because at every point we one of the reasons one of the greatest deterrents we've had of people arriving by boat is knowing the government has a strong and firm mm. position on making sure that people have to come to Australia through legal mechanisms and not have a back door uh, if the parliament seeks to undermine that and mm. if Ms Lambie decides to oppose this legislation She'll be saying there are indirect ways to come to Australia. Well, okay, incentives. On, that, on that, the boats haven't started back up under this rule and there are no ways to come to Australia. This doesn't apply to anyone and, 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 coming and to Australia. The lead times this on point. these things, Tom, are not overnight. Uh, there was a gap between when Rudd changed the laws when mm. he was first elected and then what followed and came afterwards. The same is also true. Every, nobody wants to get caught into a web but, but where this, where this path But do you acknowledge down. that you said it's a backdoor? It, it isn't. Yeah, no, no, it is. That's the thing. Why? There is a How? Why? Because people will be looking and making decisions based on what the parliament does at the moment. But it's not most, a backdoor in because the parliament would not apply it to this cohort, to, to any future cohort. I, I, I'm sorry, I disagree. Once you establish a principle in test in law, then the case and the argument will be made about why it shouldn't be expanded. And that's so the you're long saying it would be overturned in law? Well, what I'm saying is that once you establish a principle mm. and a precedent, um, you'll find exactly the same group of people who say, oh, no, we're not including any future cohort to start including them because they'll okay, make Right now case. it doesn't. You're saying it's a slippery slope. But the legislation now does not apply to future people. You but have to, no, do you no, acknowledge no, the, that? The, the legislation is, is presently covers mm. a cohort of people. But doesn't soon, cover the future. But it, well, no, but as soon as you create a pathway mm. and as soon as you create incentive, you will see a, a group of people who will start to arrive and seek to undermine right. the law. But, but right and that's now, the problem. But right now it's not a backdoor. You think well, no, I do right. think it's a backdoor because it's creating that pathway well, and that incentive, that pull factor. It's a locked factor. backdoor, maybe. And it's, a, a, it's creating a pull factor which will undermine the sovereignty and the border security of this country to no one's advantage. Asylum seekers. Right refugees or otherwise. The evidence so far is nobody has been medivaced and then returned. Does that speak at all to the hope that people have that this is a way to get to, some, uh, to Australia, even for the current cohort? Well, well Tom, we should address uh, Tim's point about this uh, creating incentives, um, creating some kind of backdoor. Well, the only incentive this could create for a prospective asylum seeker is to rent a time machine, travel back in time, get themselves involved in this cohort then, then convince a doctor that they should be medically entitled to come to Australia and then be able to stay here. There's, there's no, there's no it is a nonsense. There is not a single statement from this government about the operation of this bill that holds up to any scrutiny whatsoever. The Medivac bill is working. It is, is anyone getting very sent, sick Is anyone people. getting sent back though after treatment? Well, Tom, sick people are getting treatment. I, yeah. I'm not a doctor. I don't know how that process is, is operating. So this is the but dishonesty at the, the heart of the conversation. These and are that's people the who have been mm. on this facility in uh, indefinite detention for six years now. They have, that thanks is just to simple, the it's incompetence false. That of statement this government. Is just simply false. This government was supposed to be negotiating third country settlement arrangements for these people. They're, they're, so they, they are not resettled, but they're not in detention anymore. That's right. Well, no, uh, under, the, under the bill, people will be transferred to Australia. No, but, uh, they get medical overseas, treatment. It, 
they're no longer in detention on Nauru or Manus Island. Well, under the bill, if they're transferred to Australia, they can be kept in detention. The minister has to have a I an intervention that, to release them into the community. They're not in detention now. That's, that no, is they're the in detention. Australia for medical treatment. No, not the ones in no. Australia. I'm saying the ones still over in Manus Island on Nauru. No, they're no longer well, in sorry. detention. It, it, well, I'm talking about perpetual uh, limbo state that they have been is left it, in. Is by it this cruel government. to send someone after they've been medically evacuated? Is it cruel to send them back to one of these countries? Tom, we should be ensuring that these people get the medical treatment. I've just asked you a need. question though. Is it cruel? What is cruel is leaving these people in a state of limbo for more than six years. Mm. I mean, this government has had more than enough time to negotiate enduring permanent third country But is it cruel to send them back as a, without that resettlement arrangement? Do you, do you feel as though it's cruel to then try to send them back to... The, the current arrangement is absolutely cruel without any third uh, country resettlement arrangements. It's also completely unnecessary. These arrangements mm. are not difficult to negotiate. But is there sympathy... If the government wanted to make them happen, they could. I mean, we could work through the UNHCR. These deals are done all the time. In fact, going back as far as the Gillard government, there were third country arrangements entered into. The problem is this government does not want to participate well, in multilateral forums. It doesn't want to do the diplomacy necessary. It wants a political cudgel. Why has it, it taken so long? To why has it taken so long? Because we've, uh, we've been going through a process of getting willing partners to take uh, uh, reset, resettlement for refugees and yeah. that has not been something that we completely control. In order to maintain border security we need to make sure those people who sought to arrive by Australia via uh, means that were not authorised have a pathway to it's go elsewhere. It's a long time though isn't it? But the, right, it's the, the, the reality is that the uh, administration in the United States for the resettlement program there has taken time. I'm not contesting but otherwise. We've, not, we've yeah. consist consistently argued that the sooner people are resettled the better. It's better for them. It's better for us. It costs money to keep people in resettlement, uh, to keep people before they're resettled. We want people to be resettled right. as quickly as possible. Uh, Huawei in the news today, they're saying that the 5G ban is unfair. It will cost jobs because of a lack of competition in Australia and a lack of investment. Any agreement there? Well, that may be true, but there's still another factor which is called security. And the reason the decision was made was around security to make sure that Australians controlled our telecommunications network so that we could secure the nation uh, and make sure that we weren't exposed to foreign interference. So there's no way to sort of do it with conditions? You're saying it could well sort of leave us a bit behind technologically? Well, I don't believe we're going to be left behind technologically. I think we face choices and we have to price out the risk of foreign interference and national security. So it security might be more expensive, we're so. but we're, we're paying for national security essentially? Yes. Do you agree with that? Well, it's the price we pay not only to ensure our national security but our sovereignty, Tom. Um, Labor's been very clear that we will always take the advice of our uh, intelligence agencies, our security agencies on, on, on these matters. Um, you know, we are not privy to all of the advice that the government receives on these issues. Um, but no, I, I'm not quibbling uh, with the approach mm. the government has taken on this. What did you make of Nick Xenophon turning up? Huawei today? Well, Tom, uh, that's a, a personal judgment for Nick, who he represents. I might just make a broader comment, though, not specific mm. to Nick, but broader in the, the general context, that um, it is disturbing in some of these debates the way that uh, defamation writs are used as a cudgel uh, against people who are speaking on these issues. This is an issue that's unique to Australia. Uh, it's one that's rightly identified by the Right to Know Coalition as something that needs attention in Australia. I'm pleased to see that it seems to be getting some traction uh, through the states, initiated by the New South Wales government coming up to Canberra. But Australian defamation law is a little bit of an issue, I think, in the way that we exercise media freedom in this country. Do you see defamation law as a, an issue that needs to be fixed? Absolutely. I'm completely supportive of mm. what the New South Wales government, working with the other states, is seeking to do. Um, I've argued for defamation law to be reformed before, but Tim's right around uh, how it can be used as a weapon um, to target people who want to speak truths or challenge conventional wisdoms in the national security space. But I want to address the issue also with Nick Xenophon. The, yeah. My brutal view is that I think history will judge him very harshly. Right, just for taking on... Well, I think he's, he's chosen to go down a path and work with an actor who our national security agencies and many Australians have deep scepticism for, and I think history will judge him harshly for it. Is he what, almost selling his soul, is he? Well, I just think he's, he's made a choice and he's chosen who he's going to work for and everybody has a right to justice in this country, but he has chosen to represent um, a telecommunications company that has been denied access to Australian telecommunications network for a reason and he's chosen to pick up their cause. Can I ask you about Dr Yang Heng Jun as well? How disturbing the latest allegations that he's being uh, tortured on a daily basis in an attempt to solicit some sort of confession, presumably? 
although very disturbing, Tom, um, and at, at risk of uh, causing some kind of cataclysm in the time-space continuum, I'm going to agree with Tim Wilson in consecutive questions <laughs> here. Um, you know, Labor and, and the government are really on a unity ticket in the way that we are addressing and making representations uh, to the government in China on this issue. Mm. Um, it's important that uh, we, we, we make very firm representations uh, for the interests, for the rights of Australian citizens in these circumstances, and I fully support, as does uh, the, the Labor Foreign, uh, Shadow Foreign Ministry spokesman, uh, Penny Wong, uh, the statement made by Bruce Payne today. I want to ask you finally about Malcolm Turnbull and comments he made about loud Australians, and he was talking about progressives or, or moderates, if you like, within the Liberal Party. Is it getting harder to be a moderate in the Liberal Party? Well, I've always said that I'm a liberal, um, and that's the brand in which I carry, and that's the brand in which I proudly You're carry. You're a modern liberal. I'm a modern liberal. In fact, that's true as well. And so <laughs> I've never found any issues, in fact, to stand tall and proud for exactly what I believe in, and that's the way that I'll continue to operate, because when you have a core belief system and you have courage and conviction regardless of how easy or difficult it is and the reality is we've got to stand up all the time against those on the opposite side of the chamber uh, who those want to hound down and shout down party. discussions uh, about and the future progress of this country. Well, they're all, I, I have different opinion with lots of people but I'm not going to back down at any point but uh, that's got nothing to do respectfully with the encouragement or um, dissuasion of anyone. Of that I have no doubt. <laughs> Tim Wilson, Tim Watts, been a pleasure. Thank you.